What is going on guys and welcome back to another video. By now, I'm sure you've seen a pitch come in at 90 miles per hour and thought to yourself that that pitch was pretty quick. But what about the times an athlete comes back to the dugout and claims that the pitch is coming in hot while it's still reading the same on the radar gun? Is it possible for a pitch moving at the same speed to appear faster to the hitter? Today, we are going to be breaking down this phenomenon called perceived velocity. Welcome to Simple Saber Metrics, the brains behind baseball's latest data-driven revolution. If this is your first time here, and you want to learn more about the practical applications of baseball's latest technologies and training techniques, join the movement now by clicking the subscribe button down below. So what is perceived velocity? Well, it is kind of exactly what you'd imagine. The speed of the pitch, not the way it's measured, but the way it appears to a batter. Typically it's referenced when a pitch looks like it is coming in slower or faster than what you'd anticipate a pitch is moving at that speed would be. This can change due to a ton of different factors, and today we will be breaking down the two top theories about why this happens, and then how you can use each to improve your chances of recording outs on the mound. Starting with our first example, we will be taking a look at how the velocity of each pitch is perceived as you move up and in compared to low and away. How much of a difference do pitches thrown at the same speed appear to be to the hitter based on their plate location? Also, how does that impact the effect a pitcher has when sequencing different pitches of different speeds? Next, in our second example, which is more commonly thought of when we refer to perceived velocity, we're talking about where a pitch is released in space. If two pitches are thrown at the same speed, but one is released a few inches further than the other, what is the speed difference there, and how can you use that on the mound? Well, the obvious answer to the first question is simple. The first pitch is going to appear faster to the hitter because it takes less time to travel a shorter distance at that same speed. That should make a lot of sense, but in both these examples, how much of a difference does it make, and how can it be applied? So, in understanding how to apply perceived velocity, we're going to keep these two ideas separate, starting with our zone location. Like I mentioned before, it is widely accepted that pitches thrown up and in appear to be faster to the hitter than pitches thrown low and away, some claiming up to a 10 miles per hour spread between the two corners. That being said, it makes sense. In order to get your hands around to a pitch up and in, you have to react a lot quicker from the time the pitch is thrown, compared to a pitch that's thrown low and away. And that pitch low and away, a batter is forced to let travel deeper to send it the other way. But if this were the case, wouldn't you just want all of your lower velocity pitchers to pound up and in all the time to get that boost to their velocity? Even if this were the case, wouldn't you think you'd see more of it at the higher levels? Enter my good friend Dan, who repped his simple saber gear over on the Driveline R&D podcast a couple weeks back. I'm going to link his article right at the top of the description, because it is definitely a must read if you're interested in this topic. Using point of contact data and some simple physics equations, Dan was able to put together an actual miles per hour adjustments by zone, which was pretty interesting to look at in my opinion. You may notice that the biggest difference here is that instead of a 10 mile per hour spread between the two corners of the zone, we more realistically see about a 1.5 mile per hour difference, which is not nearly as significant as what many people currently believe. Is it different? Well, yes. But is it different enough to make an impactful difference? Before we answer that, let's take a look at our other example about perceived velocity. And again, if you want to know just about everything you could ever want to know about this topic, check out Dan's blog post for real. On to our second example. Here we are referring to extension. We've chatted about this metric before, but to serve as a little refresher, extension is the distance the ball is released from the front of the rubber measured in feet. To better understand the way this idea works, imagine a marathon runner maintaining the same speed throughout the course of two races. The first race is your typical 26.2 miles, but your second, you compare that time to a 20 mile race. Of course, the shorter race ran at the same speed is going to take less time if run by the same runner. So how can this be applied? Well first, pitchers who tally a larger extension number are all going to play up in the velocity category, at least slightly. Another way this can be used is to help you calculate perceived velocity in training, such as setting up where you should stand while throwing BP, or setting up a machine for hitters. If you take the actual velocity you're throwing at, divided by the current distance you're standing at, you could equal out that ratio as compared to your desired velocity and average distance to the plate by throwing harder or moving closer. To backtrack through this, you can divide your average extension by your desired velocity then multiply that velocity you are actually throwing at in order to find out what distance you need to stand at in order to appear as though you're throwing at your desired velocity. Obviously this isn't an exact measurement, but it can put you in the ballpark. To go through a quick example, the typical extension is 6 feet for D1 pitchers. 
and if you take 60 foot 6 inches minus that, you get your average extension marker. Then you can divide that by your desired velocity, let's say it's 90 miles per hour, all multiplied by the actual velocity you throw in BP, or to what you have the machine set up for, and you can figure out where you should be standing. For this example, you should be 27 and a fourth feet away from the front of the dish. But getting back to our question, does this difference in distance make a substantial difference to hitters? According to Perry Husband's blog, 52% of pitches with back-to-back -back effective velocities within 6 miles per hour of each other resulted in hard hit balls. That's significant. This theory says that not just a pitch's release speed matters, but the distance they must travel and the locations they enter in the zone have a major effect on the hitter's outcome. So if that's the case, then why does all this matter? Well, can these minute differences play a serious effect on a pitcher's performance? There are claims out there of different aspects of perceived velocity that can give you the appearance that you gain a few ticks by playing one of these systems, but I don't really believe this to be the case. The blog by my buddy Dan dives into the why behind all of this, but the overarching theme is that a lot of these theories make many oversimplifying assumptions about the complexity of what the batter's brain goes through each and every pitch. In my opinion, you can make some bigger strides tackling some other areas in terms of development, but it doesn't hurt to keep this pitch sequencing theory in mind the next time you hear hitters talking about pitches getting up on them quickly. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed today's video and you'd like to see more simple saber metrics, please subscribe. Click the video on the left for more baseball animations or the video on the right to check out my new vlog. Leave a comment and a like down below to show your support and I will see you next Wednesday with a new baseball animation.